What's up everybody, it's James, back with another edition of Who's Hayden Hard on Tesla today. I am joined by my co-anchor, Fitzwilliam. Say hi to the cameras, Fitzwilliam. In a shameless attempt to get more subscribers, I've decided to include my co-anchor Fitzwilliam on all future episodes of Who's Hating Hard on Tesla today. So without further ado, let's get straight to the hate. Today's topic comes yet again from the internet's finest source for fake news written by Tesla Shorts, Seeking Alpha. A contributor who goes by the name of Diesel recently wrote an article titled Predicting Tesla's Mass Market Demand Using Regression Analysis. His conclusions are total hogwash, which is easy for anyone to see, but not necessarily easy for everyone to understand why, where, or how diesel went wrong. So today, I'll be explaining regression analysis. Unless you want to, Fitzy. Fitzy, do you want to explain regression analysis to our audience here? No? Okay. So what is a regression analysis? Uh, a regression analysis is simply a scientific basis upon which to forecast something that's hard to forecast. And we call that thing the dependent variable. That's what we're interested in understanding better what the amount of that is going to be in the future. And the way the regression analysis works is by figuring out if there are relationships between that thing we're interested in and other stuff that's easier to forecast. So those other things that are easier to forecast are called the independent variables. Now you need a minimum one independent variable to do a regression analysis. That's the simplest kind of regression and it's only two variables, the independent variable and the dependent variable. When you use that kind of regression, you're saying if I can feel good about predicting what this independent variable is going to do, then based on a historical relationship that I have observed, I can predict what's going to happen with the other variable. I've probably already lost more than half of you by just saying the words regression analysis in a video. But for those of you who stuck around, I'm going to make sure you stick around by skipping straight to the conclusions of Diesel's article instead of going point by point through everything he wrote and show you this remarkable graph. The graph shows that if the price of a Tesla is $80,000, you'll sell about 25,000 vehicles per quarter. And if you cut the price by half, to $40,000 per Tesla, you'll sell about 50,000 vehicles per quarter. This relationship is linear on this graph. The demand forecast says that there is a constant rate at which demand will increase based on reductions in price. What's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, price versus sales demand curve is not linear. It's, it's a curve. The clue is in the title. Demand curve. The law of demand states that as a price is lowered, all things being equal, people will buy it at an increasing rate. Thus a curved function and not a straight line. A straight line doesn't make any sense. Because if you, follow, if you continue this straight line backwards all the way to the y-axis, it would tell you that the most demand you could ever get is 74,000 vehicles per quarter, even if it were free. Even if the price of the car were free, or, or if they were selling them for $1 each, if you could, if you could buy a Model 3 for a dollar, this forecast says that you would sell less than 75,000 vehicles per quarter not because you couldn't make more, but because nobody would want to buy them at a dollar. After the first 75,000 people per quarter, there would be no one else in line to buy your $1 Tesla Model 3. Another flaw pointed out in the comments is that he's basing Model 3 demand on the sales of Model S and Model X, which are much different vehicles 
at a much higher price point, they're not comparable and it's not valid to say that because we have data from Tesla on these other two vehicles, I can apply that to a lower priced, different vehicle. Another problem with this forecast, there are so many, is that two variable regression analysis. This puts all of the burden for forecasting demand of the uh, vehicles on the price, as though there are no other relevant factors besides price to consider. I'm going to illustrate the flaw with an ice cream analogy. Baskin Robbins charges the same price for ice cream in the summer as they do in the winter, but they sell a lot more ice cream in July than they do in January. The price is the same, but the demand has changed. Why would that be? Well, what I would like to use to illustrate uh, the difference is a two variable regression analysis. And what I'm going to use as my two variables are the amount of ice cream sold and the number of men outside in public places who are not wearing a shirt. If you were to plot both of those on an XY scatter plot the same way that Diesel plotted his two variable regression analysis with demand along your X axis and instead of price on your other uh, axis, what I'm going to use is shirtless men outdoors. What you'll see is there's a relationship between those two. The more shirtless men there are outside, the more ice cream Baskin Robbins sells. And what I'm going to do with that regression analysis is to conclude that there's a causal relationship between those two variables, meaning the more people I see uh, who are men outdoors not wearing shirts, the more I want to buy ice cream. Where is the flaw in my reasoning? Well, one of the flaws is that I said I had proved a causal relationship between those two variables. Regression analysis cannot prove a causal relationship. Regression analysis can only indicate that there is a correlation between the things that you ran through the regression based on your sample observations. It doesn't prove causality. Another problem with this is cause and effect. So what I just said is that uh, the more shirtless men people see outdoors, the more they want to buy ice cream. But the relationship could be exactly the opposite. I only have two variables, so I don't know which one is driving the other. It may be that the more ice cream men buy, the likelier they are to go outside and take off their shirt. That could be equally as true. And now, for the one you've been waiting on, the flaw that is the reason that I chose this analogy. You may have already correctly deduced. There could be a mystery variable some third variable not included in the regression analysis that's truly the cause of both of the variables in the regression. Both of these variables could be dependent variables, and the independent variable is something else. You know already, by using common sense, that the third variable not included was heat, outdoor air temperature, is the reason why people get hot and when people get hot. Uh, sometimes men will take their shirts off more in the summer than in the winter and people will buy ice cream more in the summer than in the winter. Uh, so in Diesel's forecast, what independent variables has he missed by only including price? If you've never read many of the articles on Seeking Alpha, but you've seen my videos, you may think that they only post articles by Tesla Shorts that are full of fake news, but uh, that's because those are the ones that I choose uh, to make videos about. They also post articles that make sense, and one of those articles was posted last week by Pale Blue Dot Research, uh, and it's really good and it lists a lot of different independent variables that can influence demand and will likely have 
a significant impact on future sales of Tesla's Model 3 vehicle. One of those is wait time. Not everyone is okay waiting months or years to receive a new car. The people who already have reservations for a Model 3 clearly are okay with it, but they don't represent the entire population. There are some people who were not okay with that and thus did not reserve a Model 3. Once Tesla satisfies the customers who already have reservations and they catch up, they'll be able to fill new orders probably in about a week, uh, the same as they've done in the past for Model S and Model X, which will convince more people to place an order and buy one. Another independent variable is the $1,000 deposit that Tesla now requires to put down on the Model 3 in order to hold your place in line. That $1,000 deposit may not always exist. Uh, a lot of people are fine putting down $1,000 to hold their place in line, but a lot of people are not. And those people become demand for Model 3 if the requirement from Tesla goes away at some point to place a deposit. Awareness is a big one. Tesla doesn't do any advertising at all. They don't spend money on advertising, so it's not surprising that a lot of people do not know that the Model 3 exists. None of those people are going to buy a Model 3 unless and until they find out that a Model 3 is a thing they could buy. So the more of that that happens, the more awareness increases that the Model 3 is available and it's a really great car, the more people will buy it. Test drives are another really significant driver. No pun intended. So. A lot of people will not buy a car that they haven't test driven. All of the people in line to get a Model 3 right now, there's about 450,000 of them, uh, have not had an opportunity to test drive a Model 3 at a Tesla sales center because Tesla sales centers do not let people test drive Model 3s. The few that have them have them on display in the lobby and there's lines and you can wait your turn to sit in the car, but you can't drive it. So here's one from the article that I would not have thought of because I would never lease a car. 33% of all new car sales are on a lease. The Model 3 cannot be leased right now. Tesla is only selling them, but at some point in the future, they may decide to allow leases. When that happens, 33% of all cars being leased, that means 67% are purchased, you would have a 50% sales growth opportunity to be able to sell cars to people who are only okay with leasing. Okay, here's one not found in the article. Full self-driving. The Model 3 is capable of full self-driving with the hardware that comes on board every Model 3. Now, you can choose to purchase full self-driving along with autopilot either at the time you buy the car, uh, in which case uh, 5000 for autopilot, 3000 for full self-driving, or you can buy either of those after uh, the time that you take delivery, but they each cost $1,000 more, so 6000 and 4000 would be a total of 10000 for the two. Full self-driving is not a thing yet because the software isn't ready and the regulatory approval is not ready. There's no state that has allowed the kind of full self-driving that Tesla owners would be able to implement. That is, having the car drive itself with or without anyone inside. But if you believe that Tesla will one day uh, figure out the software and get the regulatory approved. They may have the least expensive car you can buy capable of full self-driving. And now I'll hit you with a couple that could go the other way that were mentioned in the comments by Tesla Shorts. Uh, and they have a point. One of them is competition. How good will Tesla's competition be in the future? Will there be less expensive uh, high-quality EVs uh, available from other companies that eat into what would otherwise have been Tesla's demand growth potential. And the other one 
is the early adopter exhaustion. So the theory here goes, hey, those 450,000 reservations, those are all Tesla's fanboys who care about the Model 3, who booked in from the beginning, and as soon as Tesla has fulfilled all of those orders, they're going to go into this death curve where nobody else wants to buy the car because they've already sold it to everyone who wanted it. Well, if you're familiar with the product life cycle, those fanboys are early adopters. And the early adopters are not the peak of demand. They're actually a pretty low place in the demand. It rises after the early adopters because awareness increases. More people know about that product. Uh, something else that improves is affordability. Uh, there's three A's here. Awareness, affordability, the price comes down as um, scale improves and as the technology uh, becomes more fully implemented, the, the costs are driven down. And the other one is uh, availability, right? So the easier it is to get them, the more people will get them. I uh, hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, remember to click the like button and to subscribe. There's also a little bell over there that you can click that will alert you whenever I make more videos like this one. So you can get in touch with me via email, who's Hayden Hard at yahoo.com, or you can follow me on Twitter at I cannot underscore enough. So for me and for my co-anchor Fitzwilliam, signing off for this week, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Say bye-bye, Fitzy. ...per quarter. And if you cut that price in half, to 40,000 vehicles, uh, $40,000, ah, I screwed that up.